experienced foreign policy practitioner, uh, your perspective on, on what ASEAN means to the countries of the Asia Pacific region, um, why Australia has consistently sought to deepen its time, deepen its engagement with ASEAN related institutions, um, and what are the prospects and challenges for ASEAN Australia relations and indeed ASEAN itself going ahead? Um, I also don't want to box you in too much. Uh, I would, we, we all want to hear about your, uh, your views on Australian Thai relations, uh, some of your experiences uh, as a career diplomat with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, um, and maybe if you would like to, to let us know some of your views on the very recent and very dramatic changes going on in the world as we know. So with that, I'll, I'll hand over to Ambassador Paul. I've spent about half my time in the Middle East over the years. I went back to Damascus and Beirut as ambassador in the mid 90s, and half my time in, and I spent a little bit of time in Amman and a little bit of time in Baghdad. And then the rest of my time, or well, most of the rest of my time here in Southeast Asia, in Singapore, in Indonesia, and now in Thailand. And in between that time, I was at our Consul General in Hawaii, Honolulu, which was a very tough job that someone had to do. It's a unique job in our system because you work very closely with the American military. And also I was very fortunate to spend some time working in the Parliament House of Australia, first as advisor to then Foreign Minister Gareth Evans, and then more recently as the uh, 
our senior advisor, international for then Prime Minister Julia Gillard. Uh, so it's been a varied career. And any of you who are thinking of going into diplomacy, I would very much encourage you to do so. Or at least think seriously about it, because it's a wonderful thing to do. There's no greater honour, I think, no greater source of pride than to represent your country, whether it be on the sporting field or in diplomacy or in any other field. But it is a great source of pride. And on the sporting note, I should note, of course, that tomorrow night, uh, Thailand will be playing Australia in a World, Soccer World Cup qualifying match here in Bangkok. And um, I'll be there. Uh, I hope Thailand does well. Uh, but I hope Australia does a bit better. I hope you can give me a link in that. hope that phone works out. Back in 1974, Australia's then Prime Minister Gough Whitlam, who I'm perhaps one of the very few people in the room can remember, indeed knew, said that of all the regional arrangements, ASEAN is unquestionably the most important, the most relevant, and the most natural. Now bear in mind that Gough said that in 1974, 42 years ago. I think in 42 years ago, in 1974, you could have probably counted the number of people in Australia who knew what ASEAN stood for in the fingers of one hand. Uh, it, it was a relatively unknown organisation, even within government in Australia. And frankly, it wasn't a very highly regarded organisation. Uh, it had been in existence for, what, uh, seven years or so, and it was very unclear what it had achieved, what its purpose was, and what its future was. But Gough Whitlam, as was his way, he was a man of great vision in many, many things, and he was to prove very visionary when it came to ASEAN. Because through the vision of the people of Southeast Asia, ASEAN has become a defining feature of this region's stability and prosperity for 10 countries and 625 million people. And it is important not just for its member countries, for its member states, it is important for those of us like Australia who are ASEAN's friends and neighbours. And Australia is, as has been pointed out, a very old friend of ASEAN. We were ASEAN's very first dialogue partner. And that, I think, is a very important thing to remember today and into the future. It's often said that uh, far too long Australia neglected this part of the world, that Australia was far too focused on its relations with Europe, with the UK in particular, or with the United States, or with Japan, or Korea, or even China. And to a certain extent, indeed, one could argue to a large extent, much of that is true. For a long time, Australia, in the immortal words of Paul Keating, another very famous Australian Prime Minister, too many Australians regarded this part of the world as somewhere where you flew over in order to get to Europe. But that doesn't really tell the story. Because Australia has been engaged with this region very actively for more than 70 years, for 80 years. And that's reflected in the fact that we've had resident embassies in every member state of ASEAN virtually since each of those states became independent. We, of course, Australia was very closely engaged in seeing independence for Indonesia after the Second World War, when Australia, much in the face of much opposition from the Dutch colonial masters of Indonesia, from other Europeans, 
fought very hard to ensure the United Nations recognised Indonesian independence. We had a very strong role in ensuring international support for Malaysia when it became independent in the early 1960s. And Australia was very much at the forefront in bringing about peace and stability and security in Cambodia, led very much by Gareth Edmonds, the then Foreign Minister, to secure the Paris Peace Accords. And of course, tens of thousands of young people from Southeast Asia have studied in Australia from the 1950s onwards in the Colombo plan of follow-up schemes. And we built bridges, literally. The Thai Lao Friendship Bridge, which marked its 20th anniversary this year. Demonstrates how Australia was doing connectivity within ASEAN before ASEAN had even heard of the word connectivity. I doubt if even Gough Whitlam would have realised in 1974 that today Australia, uh, ASEAN would be Australia's second largest trading partner. Second only to China. If you count all of the countries of ASEAN together, ASEAN as a group is Australia's second largest trading partner. In other words, it's a, big, it's a bigger trading partner for Australia than Japan, the European Union, or the United States. It's about a $92 billion, that's $92 billion two-way trade relationship, second only to China. And that's doubled in the last 10 years. Trade grows for a range of reasons. And Australia and ASEAN have worked very hard to ensure that the free trade agreements we have, both bilaterally with countries such as Thailand, but also through the ASEAN Australia New Zealand Free Trade Agreement, promote trade between our countries. And we have built up with ASEAN trade officials a remarkably mutual understanding and respect and the ambition to do more. And that's reflected in the initiative R RCEP, which is designed to achieve a modern, high-quality agreement amongst 16 countries to cover trade of goods and services, investment, economic and technical cooperation. And upon the conclusion of RCEP, it would involve half the world's population and 30% of the world's GDP. Much is talked about the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I have a nasty feeling that it may take some time to come about if ever. But RCEP is also going to be a very, very significant trade agreement. And we've been working with the ASEAN Secretariat on helping ASEAN member states on economic issues. And those programs are importantly not about what Australia thinks ASEAN needs, but about what ASEAN identifies itself as its priorities. And those programs with ASEAN as a whole are complemented by our regional programs, which support challenges of individual or groups of ASEAN member states. For example, we have a $10 million commitment over three years to the Mekong Business Initiative, a new facility to provide technical expertise on policy reform to governments in the Mekong countries. And we work closely with ASEAN on issues around disaster management and responses, such as the response to the 2004 tsunami, the 2008 cyclone in Myanmar, and the typhoon in the Philippines last year. Friends always rally to assist, but communication and coordination of responses is very important. Southeast Asia's transformation in the last 50 years since the establishment of ASEAN is astonishing. In framing its success though, how can ASEAN sell receding conflict and instability as an achievement? It's hard. 
but Jerusalem will assert that ASEAN habits of consultation have been invaluable in preserving a peaceful neighbourhood and a stable one. The question is to ask yourself if ASEAN hadn't existed, if it hadn't come into creation in 1967, what would the neighbourhood look like? ASEAN has had a key role in helping all of us successfully manage the changing dynamics of this region. Importantly, the relationships between and among the major players. ASEAN centrality serves as a strategic purpose in helping to balance those dynamics. ASEAN and ASEAN-led fora can make the most of this centrality with active management of some of the region's most sensitive issues. That includes, and indeed must include, the ongoing tension in the South China Sea, which affects claimants and non-claimants alike by virtue of its role as a major thoroughfare for international trade, including that of Australia. Around 60% of Australia's exports and more than 40% of our imports pass through those contested waters. That's why it's important for members of the broader region to invest in building up ASEAN-led mechanisms for dealing with security and strategic issues. And that's why Australia has consistently laid great store on those processes that have brought together ASEAN members with the wider region. That's why we chose to be a founding member of the ASEAN Regional Forum, the ARF, and have been active for the last 20 years. The ARF's work on functional cooperation across so many areas has been critical to fostering the habits of cooperation, from disaster management and maritime security to newer issues such as cyber. The ARF has delivered practical results to the regional security agenda. Australia also sees opportunity for the region with the ASEAN Defence Ministers meeting plus ADM MM plus. One thing you'll learn as you study ASEAN, it's a great organisation for acronyms, for abbreviations. Uh, you need a whole book about that thick to know them all. But with disputed territories in our region giving rise to the risk of miscalculation, the ADM M plus is fostering a military to military cooperation at the operational level is of immense value. Its efforts on building relationships and familiarity between services is a vital role to play in our regional security, complementing that of the R and the East Asia Summit. From Australia's perspective, the East Asia Summit is the premier regional forum. It's a leaders-led process. It includes all ASEAN members, together with the key players in the region, with the United States, China, India, together with Australia, New Zealand and Korea at the one table. And it has a mandate to address the most compelling issues of our times. With ASEAN in its centre, the East Asia Summit does represent a potential anchor for our region's peace and a stabiliser for our region in challenging times. And we see the EAS as an organisation to build confidence and nurture a culture of dialogue and collaboration on security issues in this part of the world. We also want the EAS, EAS to ensure that regional financial and economic integration keeps moving forward, binding our economies together and deepening our mutual interest. And we see the EAS as a vehicle to address the transnational issues of our times, including resource and food security, non-proliferation and terrorism, disaster management and pandemic response. In all of this, our objective should be to nurture habits of consultation across the region. Consultation, as ASEAN has taught us, can make the search for solutions easier and diminish the risk of miscommunication. Since the ASEAN Charter, ASEAN has been looking increasingly outwards to the world. That's evident in many ways. 
a great sense of welcome that newly arrived ambassadors to answer to and sense when they take up their positions. The global view that recurs in ASEAN led statements and epitomised by the Bali principles, the determination to ensure that ASEAN's own economic community takes advantage of economic integration on a broader scale, such as with ASEAN. So as ASEAN contemplates its next big step, framing its vision beyond 2015, its friends stand by in support, confident in the great ASEAN ambition of fostering stability and promoting prosperity will continue to project out onto a broader canvas, aspiring to further integration, liberalisation and openness. A key, future, a key feature of Australia's past, present and future relationship with ASEAN is a culture of two-way partnership. Partnership is a key word in this context. It's a notion that Australia has much to learn from our friends in the region as we have to convey to those friends. And that underpins the thinking of the new Colombo Plan. Our scheme to provide opportunities to young Australian students to live, study and work in ASEAN. And over the last two years, for example, more than 300 young Australian undergraduates have studied here in Thailand under the new Colombo Plan. And many thousands more around the region. And last year, in 2015, Australian ASEAN Council was established to initiate and support activities designed to enhance awareness, links and understanding between people and institutions in Australia and ASEAN. So it's possible to take a very positive and indeed optimistic view of ASEAN as it comes to its 50th anniversary. But for those of you who are students of ASEAN, can I suggest you should also think about uh, some possible issues that ASEAN will need to address in the coming years. And importantly is going to be how those relationships between the major players play out in this part of the world and how ASEAN is going to manage and deal with those with that impact. Um, we have to see how under administration of President Trump, the uh, United States' relationship with China will play out. We'll have to see how the United States' engagement here in Southeast Asia will play out. We'll have to see how China views its place in the region and the nature of the relationships it wants to develop with the countries in the region and with ASEAN as a whole. So whilst ASEAN can reflect on great successes, and be reasonably optimistic about the next 50 years, it also has to be accepted there will be a series of significant challenges which ASEAN will need to learn to deal with and address and find ways to manage. I might just say a few things about Australia and Thailand. Australia and Thailand have a very long relationship. Very, not as long, of course, as Thailand has had with many of the European powers and my Portuguese and French and British colleagues will always remind me how their relationships go back several hundred years. Um, Australia, of course, uh, uh, has been around for a lot less than those, uh, than those great empires were. But that said, Australia and Thailand have had a long and very close relationship for many, many years. Um, we celebrate uh, next year in 2015 our 65th anniversary of diplomatic relations. Um, for many of the Europeans, of course, they celebrate 250 or 300 years. But I like to think it's the quality of the relationship today that is important rather than how long the relationship has existed. And I think the quality of the relationship that exists between Australia and Thailand today is very, very strong. The embassy here, our embassy here in Thailand is our fourth largest in the world. 
surprises a lot of people, including a lot of Australian diplomats. Our largest embassy is Jakarta. When I left Jakarta about four years ago, we had 600 staff there. Our second biggest embassy is Washington. Whichever one of you can tell me Australia's third biggest overseas embassy or overseas mission, um, it's pre-graduation. <laughs> no, it's actually Port Moresby, which surprises most Australians. But it's because of the particular relationship between Australia and Papua New Guinea, the historical relationship. So this is our fourth largest embassy. I have something around 240 people working at the embassy in various capacities. And that includes you know, the gardeners and the cleaners and, and, and everything. So, but it's a bigger embassy than our embassy in Beijing, for example. It's a bigger embassy than our embassy in Tokyo. Um, and that's a reflection, it's a much, much bigger embassy than our embassy in London, which is quite small. But that's a reflection of the extent of the relationship between our two countries. Uh, and that's reflected in the different approach Australia has taken to engagement with the government of Thailand since the coup in May. 2014. Uh, we were critical of the coup, we were critical of coups wherever they occur. Uh, but since then we have engaged with the government of Thailand across the whole range of activity which we do together. So Julie Bishop, the Australian Foreign Minister, is still the only Western Foreign Minister who have visited Thailand on a bilateral basis since May 2014. She was here in May last year. We've had other ministers visiting here. We have a very strong ongoing program of cooperation and partnership across a whole range of issues, whether it be involved in transnational crime, whether it be involved in working on military issues. Uh, and on the commercial side, Thailand is Australia's eighth largest trading partner do about $20 billion worth of two-way trade every year. Um, Thailand is the 16th, one, six, 16th largest source of foreign direct investment in Australia. Something close to $6 billion worth of Thai investment in Australia. It's a significant commercial and economic relationship. And Australia wants to continue to be a strong partner of Thailand as we see Thailand work on its return to democracy. And as Thailand works on resolving its challenges, one thing is clear, the strong, robust economy and a vibrant private sector are very important to recovery and growth in the years ahead. And we want to be a strong partner in that growth. Economic weight has increased in our Indo-Pacific region and with that comes greater strategic and political weight. Demographic shifts in major economies like China, Japan, India and Indonesia are having an increasing influence on economic development and providing challenges and opportunities. Most often we hear about China's emergence. And that's inevitable given the size of China. It's growing economic and strategic weight. But the transformation also takes place in regional countries like China, like Thailand, so. and that's very much part of the story. And the implication of those transformations are profound. And just consider a very basic level, the extent to which countries that were formerly aid recipients have transformed their economies and now become aid donors. And Thailand was a very, very early example of that. As long as go as 2003, the Thai government Australia asked Australia to no longer provide bilateral development assistance. But now we cooperate in providing such assistance to third countries. And that changed the sort of transformation that we welcome in our time as making a fundamental difference to the lives of the citizens of our region. Great progress has been made, as I said earlier, 
in recent years across the region in terms of trade liberalisation. Australia has new major free trade agreements with China, Japan and South Korea. Each one of them capable of billions of dollars of trade investment gains, each one of them mutually benefit. But free trade agreements can only do so much. They can only provide the framework in which economies can engage. Importantly, Australia and Thailand are complementary economies. The strengths of our resources and energy, tourism and agribusiness sectors offer opportunities in both countries. And situated in the middle of the emerging ASEAN economic community, Thailand offers much to Australian investors. And Australian businesses of strength and services can help Thailand achieve its goal of becoming an even greater trade in nature. But that's going to require considerable work and considerable effort. And you here today are going to have to be part of that work and effort. And I would, as you've already been encouraged, encourage you to think carefully about the possibility of further study in Australia. We have about 28,000 Thai students studying in Australia now. That makes Thailand around the fifth or sixth largest source of foreign students in Australia. It's a small figure compared to the numbers we get from China and India, but it's still a very significant, a very significant number. And indeed, Australia is the third most popular study destination in the world for foreign students, after the UK and the US. And indeed, I've seen some figures today, though, where the numbers of foreign students going to the UK quite significantly declined. Uh, following changes in the UK visa policy and also Brexit. There are now more than two and a half million former international students from Australia. That is two and a half million overseas students who have studied in Australia and returned to their countries of origin. Australia now, and virtually every recent university ranking scheme that's come out in the last three or four months has six of its universities ranked in the top 100. If you think about it, six out of the top 100, okay, it's not doing too badly. Bear in mind, of course, Australia has a population of about 23 million. Bear in mind that Around half of the top 100 universities are in the United States. Bear in mind that second after the United States is Britain, which has eight universities in the top 100. Australia has six. We're not doing too badly. And the fact that Australian universities do very well, despite our very small population size, is, in my view, attributable in no small part to the foreign students we attract because they bring new quality, new skill, new ability to our universities. I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect if we did not have the very large foreign student population we have at our universities, we would not have such a good result in terms of producing six out of the top 100 universities around the world. And Australia has produced 15 Nobel Prize laureates, which again, for a country of 23 million people, is not, not bad going. And every day, over 1 billion people around the world rely on Australian discoveries and innovations, including penicillin, IVF, ultrasound, Wi-Fi, was an Australian intervention. intervention. Those of you looking at your phones at the moment, wouldn't be able to do it if it wasn't for an Australian invention. The bionic ear, cervical cancer, black, block, black box flight recorders, these are all Australian invention, inventions which have changed lives for the better. So I really do encourage you all, as you think about where you might go for your future study, to think carefully about Australia. 
I'm a product of the Australian university system. Um, I ended up in Bangkok, I never thought I, I would. But our university system is, is, a great, is a great credit to Australia. Having done that bit of advertising, I'll leave what I have to say there because I think it's very important that you have the opportunity, I hope you take the opportunity. I very much encourage you to take the opportunity to ask me a few questions. Um, as I say, I did teach for a couple of years at university and I don't want to end up in a situation where I have to point to people and say, ask me a question. Uh, but thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. I wish you all very well in your studies and I look forward very much to your questions. And thank you very much.
are generally about different conceptions about how those things are going to be delivered. Um, and different, different parties, different individuals will have different conceptions about how, the, how those things will be delivered. So I think we have to wait to see how Mr. Trump, once he becomes president, determines how he will firstly promote and protect America's interests generally, and how he will ensure ultimately the safety and security of the United States. And, and that means not just its security in a, in a military sense, but also economic and social security. Uh, he will have to deal with the world as it is. Uh, there's a lot of difference between dealing with the world when you're uh, uh, campaigning for office and then dealing with the world as it actually is when you come into office. So I won't speculate too much, but I, I think the interests which the United States has the long and abiding interests which the United States has in this region, in Southeast Asia, in East Asia more generally, across the Pacific, are not going to vanish on Inauguration Day. Um, there may be a different, there may be a different rhetoric at play, there may be a different language used, um, but I think, uh, I think ultimately the United States interest in and engagement in this region will be maintained and continue. That's, uh, I, I agree. So the, the US interests don't change, but you do say that maybe some of the, the rhetoric changes. If you're in ASEAN, Southeast Asia, where there is a population maybe 50% Muslim, um, perhaps do you think this might accelerate a, a perception change among ASEAN countries about what the United States might be able to provide uh, you know, the, the reliability of the United States and whether even among domestic populations, whether retaining such a strong United, uh, United States, you know, such a strong relationship with the United States is even acceptable to us in other countries. Well, I'll leave it to the governments of us in countries to make their judgments and decisions. But a uh, third point I'd make is you know, Mr. Trump said a lot of things during the campaign on building walls and stopping people from coming into the country. We just have to wait to see um, what, what the reality is uh, once he's in government. Um, once he becomes president, as I say, he then has to deal with, deal with the world as it is. He has to deal with the interests the United States has. He has to best determine how those interests are going to be protected and pursued. Um, he's obviously created a lot of uncertainty uh, amongst many people in the United States and overseas. Uh, a lot of people will be looking for some reassurance. Uh, but I say, I'm, I'm not going to speculate one way or another how it will come about. And, and a note of caution here, of course, within the American system, um, creating an administration in Washington can take a long time because virtually everyone uh, within the current administration will be out the door and a whole new group of people have to be uh, appointed. We go through a very rigorous process of vetting by uh, you know, the FBI and by Congress. So it can take, often take quite some time for all this to be vetted down. So I don't know that we necessarily don't have early answers on any of these questions uh, uh, next year. Um, but I'm sure a lot of people will be spending a lot of time writing and saying a lot of things for, for some time to come. That might be, that might be me. <laughs> that could be mine. Uh, there is, uh, you, know, you can hope that there is some cushion in the American political system, in the machine of the political system where you know, Donald Trump can't come straight in, wipe the slate clean. Uh, well, it's a point I make a lot of people. People still talk about the US president as being the most powerful person in the world and in the sense that he's commander-in-chief of the most powerful military arsenal in the world, that is, that is so. But the President has to deal with Congress, uh, he has to deal with the Supreme Court, 
he has to deal with the Joint Chiefs and staff, the military heads of the American Armed Services. So there are there are constraints, uh, and that's the whole purpose of the American Constitution is to provide a series of checks and balances on presidential authority. Um, so uh, he, he, he does have to manage now within that system. If anybody watched his 60 Minutes uh, interview last night, I think you seeing a man who very quickly had to deal with the realities that uh, now he's president. It's quite surprising. So we'll take some questions from the audience. The first question, please. Uh, okay. Um, introduce yourself. And, uh, um, Dr. Thomas Hoy. I'm a mature age student, otherwise known as a teacher here. Uh, uh, and I just want to clarify, I'm also an Australian, by the way, so... Uh, I read recently uh, somewhere, Bangkok Post or whatever, that uh, there was a cooperative military exercise between Australia and Thailand in, in Chondri, I think, uh, specialising in urban warfare. Um, and, and you mentioned ongoing military co cooperation, and this quite surprised me because I thought the policy was post-coup until a return to democracy, uh, military exercise, cooperation through the form of military exercises uh, would be stopped. And it, it particularly surprised me given that it was urban warfare, I think, which, uh, well, the military in Thailand has a bit of form in urban warfare, and I, I'm not sure they should be encouraged in that direction. Um, so what is the situation? Is, you know, I mean, is there military, are military exercises, have they been legitimate and has something changed? Was that the policy or maybe I misunderstood it? Okay, thank you. No, that's all right. Um, at the, immediately after um, the coup in May 2014 here, um, Australia suspended three military activities, as I recall. That was three out of about, I'm not sure the total number, but 25, 30 or so activities. Um, I think all but one of those have since resumed, so two out of those three have since resumed. We didn't suspend training activities, um, such as what you've just referred to, a particular exercise, uh, the Chamber, indeed I went to the opening of it, um, uh, last week. Um, we, have, of course, have to balance interests in terms of working and training with the Thai military with concerns about human rights issues and so forth. Um, but we, as I say, have a very strong uh, history of military relations with Thailand. Uh, Every year we have about 150 Thai officers studying in Australia. Um, and we think it's important that, as we've talked about in terms of consultation through ASEAN and, and, and on a range of issues that our militaries, Australia, Thailand, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, have a degree of engagement and relationships that uh, enable them to work together if, if necessary. Um, it's uh, important that um, we have a habit of engagement and relationships which, if necessary, can be called upon in the future. Um, okay, any, any students uh, would like this question? Ms. Ms. Coy? Yeah. Okay, I'm the behalf of third year student uh, from ASEAN Faculty China and past Thai and Korean. I have a question like by exchanging practicing and mechanisms such as Bali Forum. Um, how do you think that this will help um, bring democracy to the country and improve the democratic institution in ASEAN? Okay, I'll, I'll try and I think I heard the question, but I'll uh -huh. just make, make sure. But you're asking about improving the quality of democratic institutions yeah. in ASEAN. I think the first thing is, obviously, um, there's a very uneven quality about these institutions across ASEAN. 
Um, the various countries of ASEAN are at different levels of development in terms of these institutions. If you look at um, countries um, such as Thailand, um, Singapore, Philippines, um, they have had a long history of such institutions. The, if you like, the, uh, there have been over time threats to those institutions quality and, and independence, but there is a long history of it. Uh, other countries such as Vietnam, Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos, even Indonesia have a, have a much shorter, indeed almost um, negligible history of these sort of democratic institutions. Australia sees very much its role as being one of encouraging those democratic institutions and the development of those democratic institutions across ASEAN. Um, but we have to accept that the pace of development of those democratic institutions is going to vary from country to country. Um, but the more we can demonstrate the value to each country of these institutions, the critical role they can play in the social, economic and political development of the countries, the better. Uh, ultimately, we see a strong ASEAN strong member states of ASEAN as being important and critical to Australia and having strong institutions is very important. And so here in Thailand, um, what we've sought to do through, for example, through the embassy is engage very much with, uh, with many of the important institutions of Thailand to encourage them to exchange best practice, to work with them in, in developing um, their processes. Uh, uh, say um, things like the Bali Forum uh, can be a, a strong exemplar, a strong example to other countries of the region uh, about the way they should look to develop their own national institutions. But they are national institutions. And I think it's important to recognise when we talk about ASEAN, we're not talking about something like the EU, uh, the European Union, which is looking to, which is actually imposing. <coughs> Um, a set of institutions across the member countries of the EU. Here in ASEAN you have uh, quite a small um, secretariat, quite a small headquarters in Jakarta. It's not imposing institutions across those so national institutions. And those national institutions ultimately will only develop at the pace in which the people of those countries are able to pursue it. Um, now frankly, we would like to see a much faster, a much um, stronger uh, development of democratic institutions in a number of countries uh, in the region, including member states of ASEAN. But um, we can't, you know, it's wrong for Australia to be lecturing in terms of how that's to be achieved, where there are opportunities to partner with countries to assist them in developing institutions, we will always be very happy to do so. Please, at the back there, you got a question? You got a microphone? Yeah, I'm from the second year student. By looking closely to the status in ASEAN Summit, which ASEAN has a direct force, how do you believe that this can solve the political and, in, uh, and security issue is an increasing reach to the region? Thank you. Uh, how to, sorry, we can play here. Is that question how to strengthen the existing ASEAN mechanisms to deal with sort of new challenges ahead? Yes. Is that right? Well, I think increasing. Look, I think there are a number of issues around that question. It's a very important one. Um, frankly, one of, one of the problems ASEAN faces is the fact that. The Secretariat in Jakarta is very underfunded. You know, there are some very, very good people working in the Secretariat in Jakarta, very talented people, but there are not many of them. There are very few number um, overall. And, and in part, that's the lack of funding is a reflection of the um, funding mechanism that ASEAN set up, which is basically that it's worked out what is the maximum amount that the poorest member state of ASEAN can pay. I think that's probably now. I'm not sure which one. But anyway, 
It's, the, it's, it's, it's one of the criticisms often of ASEAN that it's the lowest common denominator organisation, and in this case on finances, it's the lowest common denominator. So um, at the end of the day, uh, Indonesia, Thailand, Singapore pay exactly the same much in contribution to ASEAN as Laos, Cambodia, and Myanmar do. Um, I think there's a very strong argument to be made that uh, countries should be expected to pay, and the richer, wealthier, and the developed countries of ASEAN should be expected to pay uh, a greater contribution, as is done, say, in the United Nations, where uh, contributions to the United Nations are determined on a, a GDP basis. Uh, but that's a, ultimately a matter for ASEAN itself to, to decide. Um, but, but frankly, uh, without a significant sizable injection of funds into the Secretariat, it's going to be very hard for the Secretariat to perform much more than it does at the moment. Um, the, another big issue that really faces ASEAN uh, is the whole issue around consensus. Uh, every decision effectively within ASEAN relies on, dis on consensus. All 10 ASEAN members have to agree. Um, now, it's understandable why that was decided to be the process and why it was considered the best thing to do was to have consensus decision making. But I think there are a lot of questions going on within ASEAN now. Within ASEAN, I'm not talking about something that's not an issue within ASEAN as to whether in the 21st century, looking at all the various challenges ASEAN faces, whether consensus decision making is the best best thing to do. And perhaps, you know, there's talk about perhaps going to you know, a 10 minus one formula, perhaps for decision making, which if one country has a particular problem with with uh, the decision, it steps it steps aside and, and allows the other nine to, to take forward what they agree on. Um, but they're all matters that are going to have to be decided within ASEAN. You know, we in Australia and, and, and other dialogue partners will continue to do what we can do to assist in strengthening ASEAN's institutions, but ultimately the strength of ASEAN's institutions will depend on its members and, uh, and what they wish to do. Is there anyone else? We have, otherwise I'll, I'll ask. Oh yeah, I'll tell the chip, please. Arabic. 
But I think language can be important. I think, you know, obviously the entire system of English language students are important. I think increasingly many foreign ministries Mandarin is, is seen as being very important and useful. So if you bring a particular language school, I think it, it's not going to guarantee that it will be useful. But I think the most important thing is to demonstrate to the selection committee or whoever is, is choosing the people that you, you, you are a well-rounded well person, that you are someone who um, is able to work with other people. As much of diplomacy is about, ultimately, about working with other people. Um, it's about working with your team in the foreign ministry, but it's also about working with uh, other diplomats from other countries. You know, negotiating and such things is still a very important part of diplomacy. So, showing that you can work with other people, um, that you can work with other people from a whole wide variety of backgrounds, so, you know, you can adapt quickly because uh, you will find yourself in very different environments uh, during the course of your time as a diplomat. Uh, very different cities, very different locations. So you need to be able to demonstrate that you can are uh, able to adapt and to, uh, and, and to uh, adjust. And um, what else? What is it? Do you have I think just the one thing that I learned from my experience is to take opportunities that aren't just about study, so to live overseas, to volunteer, to take up work opportunities that you don't necessarily think um, will lead to a career in diplomacy. Uh, sometimes they do. So I, um, I uh, was living in Indonesia and I was a volunteer there, and that led me on a career path to working with the UN, then on to working for an NGO, and then working the foreign ministry, so I'd say just take those opportunities where they come. Um, there's no shame in not getting in in your first attempt, um, so if you, don't, if you don't get in the first time, try again. Um, but yeah, other than that, I, I'd agree with everything the ambassadors said. I should have But um, no, I think that's an important point. It comes to what I was saying about um, adaptability. I think if, you, if you've demonstrated the fact that you can live in foreign countries, work in foreign countries, operate in foreign countries, work with different people, um, it's very important. I didn't have that, in a sense, but you know, I demonstrated I've been able to come from a very small country town in Tasmania and uh, <laughs> managed to, to, to get myself through a uh, new to Canberra. I guess they saw that as being adaptability in a different form, but that's a very good thing. Someone like Kevin Rudd as well, he came from a small town in, uh, in Queensland, didn't he? We were actually at university together exactly the same time, but I never knew him. We mixed in different circles. Uh, so, are there any other questions that we have here? We've got students uh, in this room from Malaysia, Japan, China, Thailand. So second year students, exam year students, third year. We discussed the notion of face, remember? So, this is one of those moments you can gain face. <laughs> one of the top high, high rank around the world. What can you suggest to Thai education to be developed further? Like, since you can see now, no one asking the question. From your point of view, you can suggest some, uh, some comment to the student for Tamasat kids to be better. Okay, um, actually that's that's something I talk quite a lot with, with, um, with people here in Thailand, with the Ministry of Education, and, also with university people and all around which I think you know, I, I've been here just over two years and, and I remember when I arrived there was a lot of debate going on then about nature of Thai education and uh, what needed to be done. And I, I think um, I think a lot of I think people recognise the issues, the challenges. I think and I'd say that the main one goes to pedagogy. It goes to the nature of the teaching system. Um, 
You know, I read, uh, I think, today that Thai primary school students have done very well at some uh, education Olympiad in Indonesia. They've done very successfully in maths and other subjects. Um, but the qualities that they might have at primary school seem to get a bit lost as they go through the system. Um, I haven't sat in a Thai classroom, but I'm told uh, in primary school, high school, university, even the teaching method tends to be quite strict, quite formulaic, quite rigid. Uh, a lot of what we call rote learning, students learn a lot of facts and then reproduce those facts. But there's not much encouragement for students to think for themselves, to be innovative, to be critical. You know, the relation between teachers and students is a very formal one, um, is a very hierarchical one. Both my parents were teachers. Um, um, so I won't comment about my relationship with my parents. Um, but I know both of them, um, and even back, you know, um, many years ago, were very much of the view that um, it didn't matter about the, the standard of the students, it didn't matter about their intellectual skill, their academic skill. The important thing was to get them to think. The important thing was to make them think for themselves. So it didn't matter whether they were going to become a university professor or going to become you know, a plumber. The important thing about an education was to get the, the student to think for themselves and to think about the world in their own terms and how they approach and deal with the world. So I think this is a challenge that is not unique to Thailand. Australia's gone through it. We've reinvented our education system in Australia several times uh, in my lifetime. Um, and I don't know that we've got it right yet. Um, you know, at one stage in Australia, uh, teaching grammar, uh, grammar, English grammar, was seen as being unnecessary, that students didn't really need to learn grammar. Well, the problem with that was that we now end up with a lot of students who and I saw this when I was teaching at university, who found it difficult to put a sentence together. And I remember they, they complained to me because when I marked their essays, I correct their grammar. And I say, that's not what's important, it's, uh, it's the message that counts. I say, yes, but if you can't communicate the message effectively, there's not much point in having the message. So getting the, getting the combination right, getting the, the the combination right is very difficult, it's a great challenge, but I uh, say so from my limited understanding of the debate here in Thailand, it seems to be very much one about how do we encourage teachers, and because teachers have to do this, how do we encourage teachers to be prepared to open the classroom up for a little more discussion, a little more debate, a little more critical thinking. And it's important for parents to think about that too, because parents' attitudes are very important. Um, the one other comment I'd make um, is, is I've noticed here in Thailand, uh, I think that a lot of work has to be done here on the vocational education system. Um, I think there's a, there's a very strong attitude here that vocational education is somehow um, you know, less serious, or less sustained in than, than, say, university education. Um, you know, they're both important streams of education. And when I say vocational education, I don't just mean plumbers or bricklayers. Increasingly, we talk about vocational education, you know, computer programmers, software developers, all of this. Um, I think it's important that an education system values all its students, irrespective of of what class they are in, of what academic standards they reach, of, of what the subjects are they are studying. Um, it's important that the education system values all students equally and make sure that every student gets the same opportunities and, and, and some equality of resources.
Australia does have a very strong vocational education system. We have uh, tape writers sort of tape. Uh, what, what opportunities are there to export that? Actually, the majority of Thai students studying in Australia now are in vocational study because Australia is recognised as having one. Australia and Germany are seen as being the two countries with the strongest um, uh, vocational education system. So we have a lot of Thai students in vocational education now in Australia. Um, what we're seeing, uh, I think it, we certainly are very much trying to encourage um, stronger and bigger partnerships between Australia and Thailand in vocational education. What we're looking to do is, is actually encourage Thai, the Thai private sector and the Thai government to look at Australian vocational education system and institutions that can offer them particular courses, particular uh, ways of developing their level of skills. Um, that's something that we now We've been very much a focus for the last year or so. Very interesting things happening out on the water there. But, uh, <laughs> but, there, but there are some uh, there are some great opportunities in that vocational education area because you know we have to recognise that um, as Thailand's economy develops, as Thailand's middle class develops, the demands for professionals, the demands of people who have got technical qualifications particular skills are going to increase. And you know, you, you can find a real roadblock in terms of your economic development if you don't have that skills base. Uh, another thing about tertiary education uh, that I've noticed is in, in most countries in, in ASEAN, you can go to a, an Australian university campus uh, in Malaysia or, or Singapore or Vietnam as RMIT. Is there a possibility to open up a, a campus, you know, a Monash or an ANU campus here in Thailand? It's something we'd very much like to see, and it's something that a couple of Australian uh, universities have looked at. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, the, uh, the foreign investment rules and regulations, issues around recognition of qualifications, have not made it possible. Um, we're still talking with uh, the Thai government about what changes might be possible to enable um, Australia and indeed other uh, foreign institutions to set up campuses here. Uh, if it was, if the, if the changes were made that made it viable, I know that there is two or three Australian institutions that would be very quick to, to establish here, but um, if not for lack of interest in Australia, it's simply issues around the regulatory environment here in Thailand, which just uh, doesn't make it viable. Uh, is there anyone else? If, if not, I might just pivot back to ASEAN for a moment. Uh, our third year students, just in the last uh, fortnight, have had uh, their second tape home exam. I know, they've got another one next week, which they've asked me to cancel. <laughs> The, the take home exam question was uh, Should ASEAN expand beyond its current 10 member states? Now, I don't want to put you on the spot to answer the question here, um, but maybe you could give some views. I also saw a 7 30 report, a 7 30 television program in Australia just two days ago. Um, Paul Keating was discussing uh, the, the consequences of a, a Trump presidency. And uh, one of his recommendations during the interview was that Australia become a member of ASEAN. Now there are some obvious constraints, maybe the countries in ASEAN are good point, but uh, Australia is a member. But do you agree with him that, that Australia could and maybe should become a member of ASEAN? And more broadly, should and could ASEAN expand beyond its current 10? Okay. Um, well, obviously, ultimately, it's a, it's a matter for the ASEAN team at the moment to make that decision. I think there's still a debate amongst commentators, at least, um, about uh, whether ASEAN has successfully uh, managed its last expansion. I think there are still, you know, we did see uh, with the last expansion a number of countries becoming members of ASEAN. Um, who are at different levels of economic development, different levels of political development. 
And I think ASEAN is still working through some of the issues that come around about because of that expansion. It was a natural expansion if you look at it geographically, but you know, there, were, there were obviously some different historical forces at play. Um, Timor-Leste, East Timor, of course, is talked about by many people as, uh, as, as the next potential member of ASEAN. Australia very much supports East Timor becoming a member of ASEAN. We think it would be a very good thing for East Timor. Um, it's a natural thing, we think, for East Timor to become a member of ASEAN. Um, there are some concerns, though, within ASEAN because of East Timor's level of economic development and its size and its ability to, to be able to handle the agenda. But um, we, we think it's something we certainly support it. Um, a question of Australia. I actually think Australia will eventually become a member of ASEAN. Um, it's not necessarily going to happen in my lifetime, um, but I think it would be, presuming ASEAN um, survives uh, and continues, then I, I would have thought it would be um, uh, pretty much inevitable. But, um, it, it, it'll, it'll be a big, it'll be a big issue because Australia is obviously a significantly larger country in terms of its economy uh, than, than, than most members of the members of ASEAN at this stage. But that disparity, that relative um, difference in size of economies, is, is quite quickly changing as you see economic development, uh, the pace of economic development within ASEAN. But I think our shared interests. Um, uh, within the region as such that, I say, I'm not talking about something in the next five, ten years, it's maybe 50 years longer, but I, I, I do think it'll happen, I think it'll be good for Australia, I think it'll be good for ASEAN. And that's, that's but for 50 years, I think I'd, maybe I would be able to see that, maybe I'll still be teaching here and I'll say, 50 years ago, Ambassador Abilio, he predicted. Uh, so with that, uh, I would like to invite Ajahn Chip uh, and some students to, to come up. We have a small token of appreciation for you. Uncertain as to what this will mean. 
I think we'll just have to wait and see how he uh, decides to go forward um, on that once he becomes president. Um, I think we have to accept, unfortunately, tragically, that we are seeing in a number of places around the world, not just in the United States, but also in, in Europe, indeed also in Australia, um, examples of um, attacks, physical or, or verbal, on, on groups who are seen as being somehow different or other, whether they be Muslim or, or others. Um, you know, we see this in, in Europe, you know, not just in regards to Muslims, but also in regard to um, uh, people from the Middle East who may not be even be Muslims, uh, in, in regard to Western Europeans' attitudes towards Eastern Europeans. Brexit was, in, to some extent at least, about attitudes of some British people towards Eastern Europeans who are working with them. Um, so I think we just, frankly, we have to wait and see how he's going to take this. If, if he intends to, it may have just been campaign rhetoric, uh, appealing to what I'm very confident is a very minor, is a, is a minority view in the United States, but is quite a strong minority view in the United States attitude towards people of, of, of Muslim faith. Uh, I can certainly understand why it would be a concern to you and anyone else who is a Muslim or indeed anyone who uh, values um, the equality of us all. I'm also concerned though that the, that the, the perception of Donald Trump, no matter what he actually does in the next four years, the perception is that he will be perhaps a, a bow of